Hello and welcome. I'm Helen Atkinson, Managing Editor at Supply Chain Brain. I'm excited to be moderating this webinar today, sponsored by Texas Inc., the title for which is The Use of Robotics in a Resilient Human Capital Strategy. Now, there's no denying the fact that labor shortages have been one of the biggest points of struggle for those across all industries, not just in the supply chain. And while AI, robotics, and other forms of automation are advancing every day, human labor is still vital to the success of the supply chain. Today, we're gonna to learn why AI and robotics are an and and not an or when creating a labor strategy and why it's more important than ever to make the most of the labor you have by implement implementing programs that leverage the combined power of warehouse and labor management solutions. We're really gonna dig into how automation complements human labor in the warehouse. We'll also be looking at how to effectively manage labor in an automated warehouse. Another question we'll address is how to determine which labor mix and strategy is the right one for your operations. First, we're gonna have a panel discussion with Guy Cortin from Texas, Sid Henderson from Exotech, and Ryan Ullenkamp from Longbow Advantage. After that, we'll open it up for a Q&A session with questions from you, the audience. Please submit questions at any time using the tab at the bottom of your screen. We will not be using people's titles or company names, so go ahead and ask anything you like. If you don't see your question come up during the webinar, please be assured we will reach out to you offline. Right, let's get to our panelists. Guy Cortin is Vice President of Industry and Advanced Technology at Texas, an omnichannel supply chain technology provider, where he leads Texas's advanced technology and automation go-to-market strategy. In addition, for a long time, he's been an industry analyst covering the supply chain and retail spaces for SCM World. Sid Henderson is the Vice President of Business De De Development for Exotech North America, he comes to Exotec from robotics provider Osaro, where he oversaw international sales. And then finally, we have Ryan Ullenkamp, who is Chief Operating Officer at Longbow Advantage. Ryan works closely with customers and WMS providers to create innovative solutions that help warehouse operators define and execute on both their near and long-term digital supply chain strategies. Welcome, gentlemen. Let's get into the panel session. So, um, Sid, I've got a question for you. Um, looking back to the beginning of this year, automation was definitely all the rage, especially in the media, like supply chain brain. I know I've been writing about it a lot. Now it's, it's tended to take a bit of a backseat to things like AI and machine learning. Was it all just hype? What's happening with automation and distribution? Very good question, Helen. Um, no, automation is definitely not hype. Um, I'd say the demand in our space is really based on the steady macro trends that have been continuing to move in the same direction for a while now. These are trends like rapidly aging population, rising labor costs, um, growing cost of industrial space, higher customer expectations. Um, so I think it's really these trends more than anything that are really driving our customers to invest in automation. Um, so the underlying demand, it isn't going away. Right, so that's interesting. So not only do we not have enough people, but we need to be packing more distribution operations in, in, into the space available, is that is that right? I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ryan, what 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 do you think about that? Uh, what is is uh, the demand for automation increasing at present? I think yeah, the demand for automation is increasing. I think it's a hybrid though to bring automation and the workforce together for sure. Right, right. So, but uh, so one of the drivers of the automation discourse was the fact that labor was expensive and getting more expensive. 
And uh, I know we've just had uh, the United Auto Workers uh, agree uh, a huge pay rise uh, with with the big three. And I see Toyota has now followed suit. So wages are, are definitely going to go up. Um, is So since this is the case, how are warehouse managers coping? Yeah, I think... Um... Yeah, I think the, I mean, that that labor challenge still exists, to your point, like the, the market is still very expensive, very competitive, right? Um, so engagement with your associates, I think, be, becomes critical for a warehouse manager, um, showing that you're understanding their job and able to coach, right? So um, engaging with associates, coaching them, not just to retain your current workforce, but actually, as you bring in new hires to set that cultural differentiation, that new hires see, oh, this is different. You actually care about what I do. You understand what I'm doing. So I think the role of a warehouse manager over the last few years, but even 10 years or 20 years, has really changed. I mean, when I first started 20 years ago, you would have standards and performance management. And if you didn't meet it, you were fired. And I had a backlog of labor resource that I pull up and I train and I just keep churning through. Um, clearly not the case anymore. So <laughs> I think your, uh, your, your warehouse managers are becoming more engaged leaders. I think they're becoming better coaches. I think they're working to understand their people's challenges more. And they do that through better data, better tools, better visibility into the operation. Hmm. I think bringing that to the forefront and getting managers out of Excel spreadsheets where they're trying to crunch numbers and figure out what the problem was, bringing that right to them saying, there are issues here, go um, be more proactive, get out on the floor. That's the unlock. And I think that's what warehouse managers are trying to do to cope with it is get out of spreadsheets, get on the floor and have data at their hand mm. to, to better coach and, and train and engage with their associates. Right. So, so dare I use the term emotional intelligence? Is that what you, we're looking for? It's a good <laughs> term to use. Yes. Fantastic. But also this idea of, of being able to access data in real time while you're on the floor, not just sitting in, the, you know, typ the typical warehouse has this sort of bird's eye, uh, you know, sort of nest where the, the manager looks through a window at what the workers are doing. And that sounds like that's just not going to fly anymore. As it were. Uh, that, yeah. That's great. Yeah, I was going to say, sort of to build on what Ryan was saying, I think it's spot on, is, and to what you just said there about the data and that bird's eye view, I think what we're seeing, at least what I'm seeing too, is, you know, warehouse managers, it sounds cliche, but have to be people, right? They have to manage their people as they would want to be managed. And I think what we're seeing more and more, and back to what Sid said to begin, right, the, the shortage of labor, but also the strain being placed on warehouses that is not the same that it was 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago for a whole host of reasons. So now we have to manage as we should as a human. So yes, use data because data is important, but also to what Ryan said, walk the floor, be, be approachable, be personal, understand your people and how to manage them and how to get the most out of them. I think those are, are some really key trends we're seeing more and more because you know what, what Ryan said, right? This is not 20 years ago where you just, You've got labor, you've got rules, you've got expectations. They don't meet it. You get rid, you get someone else, you train them up you, and, you're, and you're all rinse, repeat. That's no longer the world we live in. Yeah, yeah, no, indeed. And and just coming back to the space thing briefly, Guy, you know, that I, I know that, you know, when I used to go in a warehouse, there'd be some vast area in the corner where all the Christmas stuff was, you know, that didn't get used the, re the rest of the year. And that I, those days I think are, are gone. Um, Guy, um, based on what Sid and Ryan were saying, what you said, what should be the trigger for a warehouse manager or supply chain leader to start considering automation? And who should they talk to first? I, I think the trigger has has already happened, right? I think to build on again what Sid was saying uh, in terms of what he's seeing, the shortage of labor, that's a huge one. Uh, what Ryan was saying, the retention of labor, right? Making sure that you not only get labor, but you keep that labor. I think that's very important. Uh, and the third big one is, of course, the, the changing dynamics of the warehouse itself within the fulfillment network. There was a really interesting study by Gartner and also, I think, by Ernest Young that showed, you know, if you look at the top three drivers, those are, that's it. You know, labor, labor retention, uh, and new warehousing. So the, the trigger's there. So I think anyone who isn't already thinking about it, I'm not saying run out and invest in automation and put robots yet, but you need to be thinking about it. 
to your question about who to speak to, I think that's the that's the interesting part. I know we'll we'll dive into more of this, but I don't think it's a sort of a one size fits all where okay, if you need robotics, go talk to you know your chief supply chain officer or your COO and and get her to approve you know a million dollar budget to put X Y Z robot in there. I think you really have to, and I apologize, sound cliche, but start with the end in mind. You know where where is your warehouse going for the next year, two years, ten years, twenty years? What is the type of inventory that you're moving through your warehouse? Uh, what is your labor going to look like? Is your labor going to be complementary to the automation? Or are you trying to replace some of your labor or supplement some of your labor? I think those are the questions you need to start thinking about before you then start diving into, okay, well, which automation do I want to look at? Who do I want to speak to? Uh, but you, of course, have to have to absolutely get buy-in from the, you know, the C-suite, because at the end of the day, these are, whether it's a, you know, a smaller version of an AMR where you're just going to rent the robot or a larger infrastructure play, uh, these are physical items you're putting in your warehouse that you need to understand from the overall strategy. How is it going to play to your long-term goals with regards to your fulfillment, your supply chain, your warehouse? Uh, but that triggering question um, anyone listening to this, you know, you need to start thinking about automation, I'm not saying run out and buy automation, but you need to understand where does it fit in your long term strategy? And when do you need to start looking at bringing some in? Or maybe you don't, but you need to be aware of it and understand what decisions you will make around that. Right. Yeah. So basically, the, the time to start is now. But Guy, tell me, can you give me a couple of examples of, of, of trigger points? Because I mean, your warehouse management uh, and supply chain managers are constantly firefighting every day. So it's hard for them to think of these bigger picture things that, that you know, frankly, are going to be a pain to implement or at least, you know, daunting in, in some way or other. Do, do you have a sort of typical sob story that somebody comes to you with goes, well, you know, we were trying to get Black Friday sorted and it all was a disaster. Is that is that typical? Is there a crisis often that sort of prompts this? Absolutely. There's, there's obviously always usually sort of a, a the burning platform, right? So I think there's a couple to, to think of. Uh, one is, you know, traditional sort of e-commerce world. Oh, you know, my, my e-commerce sales are going through the roof. Uh, I can't pick in my warehouse fast enough to meet those orders. What do I do? Okay. You know, robotics, AMR solutions might be the right place to go. Or for example, you know, my warehouse is being asked now to hold, you know, 2x the amount of inventory I used to. And I need to find a place to store it and get access to all right, well, maybe there's something where you want to look at, uh, you know, sort of an ASRS type system where you can store, have more high density of storage, right? That's a trigger point. Um, right. I've even seen down to the point of, you know, people, we talk about labor. Uh, some have come and said, oh, you know, I have 1.5 FTE. All they do is they move dunnage every day. And all of a sudden they realize, well, you know what? I can go out and actually get a robot that will do it for me. Uh, by the way, it doesn't take smoking breaks. It doesn't, you know, show up late to work. Uh, it will just do its job. So maybe that's a, a smaller use case, but all of a sudden it gives you an opportunity to focus in on specific use cases where, again, to your point, Helen, there's a trigger event. Oh, I don't have enough labor to do this. Oh, I need more storage. Oh, I need more velocity of moving items out of my warehouse. Oh, I need more precision of picks, right? I need to have my orders get to the five nines of reliability to pick. Maybe the robot's going to help me do that. So I think those are some of the trigger points I've seen. So you're absolutely right. There absolutely are going to be those burning platforms that people need to, to identify within their warehouse and then identify beneath that, is there potentially a solution that is a robot that can help me get there? So I do think, yes, and, and you know each warehouse is going to be unique. They're going to be a thousand burning platforms. Let's face it, right? You said we're always firefighting. Uh, and it doesn't mean that there's going to be a robotic solution for each one of those, but it's really the discipline to look at those and then to identify which ones could be addressed by automation and then to find the right solution to solve that problem. Right. Thank you, Guy. And 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 so let's dig into that a little bit, you know, because there are all these uh, different automation hardware types in, in the marketplace from conveyors, pit bulls, AMRs, Skypods, uh, any combination of those. Um, um, Sid, can you tell me what drives the selection and implementation of a particular type or combination of automation hardware? 
Yeah, Helen, I, I think that the two main factors that typically drive the solution selection are performance and flexibility. If, if your warehouse requires a very high throughput, um, then a traditional source of automation, like a shuttle system, um, it's probably going to be what you're going to lean towards. It's going to be um, a higher capex. It's a higher investment. You're you're going with a solution that you are going to have for maybe the next ten years, um, but you're optimizing for performance. On the other hand, um, if you're maybe a company and your operations that's growing quickly, or you have high forecasted growth. Um, Maybe you're not ready to make a large CapEx investment right now. Maybe you have some uncertainty about what your future is going to look like in terms of your omni-channel distribution or just your needs in general. Um, you're going to want to boost in your productivity and your performance, but maybe you don't want to take the risk of a more rigid shuttle system. You want uh, an AMR solution, Thomas Mobile Robot, um, there are OPEX options. There's a lot of flexibility there. Yes, it comes with some limited performance, um, but that might be a great solution for you. And for a lot of the companies that are experiencing high growth, um, but maybe they're not at $2 billion a year annual revenue, that's going to be a great solution. Um, but what we're also seeing now are a new generation of solutions similar to Exotech that are trying to optimize for the balance between high throughput and flexibility so that you get a system that is the right fit for your current operations, but will also have the flexibility to adjust as your company changes over the next decade. So, Sid, are we talking about robots that can perform different types of tasks or, or just ones that can be moved to different parts of the warehouse? I think it's more, is your throughput, are your throughput requirements going to be changing? Or um, are your storage requirements changing? Um, or do you need, um, because... The way this this can work is if you um, if you have a system where you can just add more robots to get more throughput, or you can add more racks to get more density and more storage without disrupting the operations, then that's a really flexible system that that can change and adapt with you over time. And and customers, a lot of customers are going to get a lot of value from that um, because it really allows them to to optimize as time goes for their operations. Right, yes, and of course, it's not just about robots, it's about racking and all sorts of other uh, automation hardware. Thank you. Um, but automation is just one piece of the puzzle and human labor is still a much larger piece. Um, Ryan, how would you describe the relationship between labor management and the selection and deployment of automation? How do they work together? Yeah, I would. Well, they're definitely complementary. I, I actually would go as far as to say it's a symbiotic relationship. There's mutual benefit um, between automation and the human workforce. Um, automation has the ability to replace and take over some of the most physically challenging and monotonous tasks, which are very hard roles to fill with humans. Um, so I think the right automation solution, like Sid talked about, and I think a lot should go into identifying the right automation, but that can change the user experience in the warehouse, right? That completely redefines what work looks like for a human. Um, I well, also like he, he was saying, you know, yeah. you know you, you're spending hours a day dealing with dunnage. You know, who wants to do that? Right. You can get a robot to do it. Yeah. Heavy lifts, a lot of bending, miles and miles and miles of walking. Like those are the things we start to eliminate. Um, with an automation solution. And I don't think automation is is about replacing jobs. It's about reducing those impacts, right? Those burdened uh, pieces of the work, as well as uh, we've all seen how warehouses solved peak problems is mandatory overtime, long hours grind, like eight weeks of mandatory overtime, right? They, these are grinds. So I think that's the relief valve, um, uh, along with resiliency and a ton of other 
uh, benefits there. And I think it also allows the human workforce to focus on more meaningful and value added tasks and creative tasks than, than the monotonous ones we talked about. I, I would stress, and I think Guy and Sid have both hit that earlier, the, it, to bring all of that together, you really need to make sure you pick the right solution. And I would, I would urge everybody to really think about the change management piece that goes into that. How am I communicating um, the impact, the positive impact that an automation solution has while I also look at the unlock and how I'm going to engage with my people? Yeah. Ryan, I, so, oh, say just to add on to Ryan's point, I mean, I, I, I so much agree with everything you're saying. And especially in the context of this new law in California where fast food workers are going to be making $20 an hour. I think something that's going to come more and more into focus is, are we optimizing for our labor force's happiness, that the worker's happiness inside the warehouse? How can we do that? How can we have them prefer to work in the warehouse and not work in fast food? And automation is a great way of making those workers happier and making their days easier. And I think that's a really important thing for us to be thinking about now. Right. I, I've read several accounts of, of uh, warehouse managers running events as sort of meet the robots and even having robot naming competitions in the staff, um, which, you know, obviously really uh, increases the sense of welcoming and, and that the, 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 the two elements are going to work together. Guy, do you have any particular insights in, in how to make sure that uh, robots make people happier or automation makes people happier? No, I, I, I agree. I think, I think Sid, you made a fantastic point, sort of measuring labor's happiness in this equation. But yeah, you know, hell, I did see one robot the other day, uh, a drone uh, transporting beer around. So maybe that's one way to make, make people happy with <laughs> robots. But Sounds I, good. I, I you know, I think part of it is, is you're absolutely right, is is both to what Ryan was saying and, and I think what Sid was saying about this happiness level. And I, I don't want to sound all rainbows or unicorns, but the reality is, you know, the robots, yes, they're there to do, there to do a job, but they also add value to the experience. You know, one of the one of the lessons I saw, so, you know, before, before coming to Texas, I worked at Six Rivers uh, during the pandemic. And, you know, A, during the pandemic, we saw robotics or robots being able to keep labor distant, right? So there was that added value in terms of uh, using the robot. But secondarily, you know, and I'm going to bring this this up, and I know I'm going to roll my eyes when I say this, but the millennials, um, you know, when we look at this new workforce, I think, you know, Sid, you mentioned the workforce is aging, but we're also getting a, a new workforce coming in that guess what? They're used to being on touchscreens and iPhones and iPads and, you know, Samsung devices. So, to be able to go into a warehouse and work with a robot that mimics what they're used to, what they enjoy interfacing with, as opposed to working in a fast food restaurant or working at a warehouse that you're still pushing that cart up and down the aisle and you're picking off a paper. You tell me, like, you know, if, if I'm a 22 year old coming out and I'm looking for a job and I've got two opportunities or paying about the same amount of money, but I'm working in one warehouse where I work with this robot that's cool. That has a touch screen. I, you know, I pick it up within five minutes. Why? Because I'm just used to that. Or it goes to other warehouse, and they're like, "Oh yeah, you see, you see that cart? Well, guess what? You're gonna be pushing that all day. And by the time you're done, you're done picking each time. It's gonna be about 200 pounds. So, you know, hey, if you want to work out, yeah, go to that, go to that warehouse. But you know, it gets old after a while. So I do think we're we're absolutely seeing where a value out of the robotics coming in to complement the labor is to hit all the things we just talked about. And I think this sort of happiness of work quotient will certainly see robotics being a bigger part of that equation than honestly we thought was gonna happen. I, I, like I said, I, when I worked at Six River, we never thought that you know having a robot, working with a robot because it was cool would be a big driver, but it turns out that it is. Right, yeah, the, I think the cool tech factor is is very important and it, and, it, and it speaks to an overall problem with the supply chain industry that it's not super attractive or hasn't been super attractive. It's very uh, old fashioned in most people's uh, minds. And I think this is really help, helping improve the overall impression of what it's like to work in supply chain jobs. Let's talk a little bit about cost because the cost of automation seems to be growing. Um, are we seeing a shift from the original mindset of automate to save money 
to automate to be more productive with ROI coming from improving the operation and not in from cutting staff. Uh, Guy, what, what do you have to say about that? Absolutely. Um, I think that what I've seen more and more of, and, and this will take time to switch the mentality, is that our, our way of looking at ROI is starting to shift exactly what you said, Helen, from a, oh, if I bring in X amount of robots, I save Y amount and I can cut Z amount of FTE. That's still going to be a factor. And I certainly don't want to say that that is not going to be part of the equation. But I do believe that what we're seeing more and more of is that the savvy thinkers when it comes to automation are looking at what is more of the long-term viability of robotics and how do we better you know, measure what it's going to impact in terms of how I, as a warehouse, address my end customer's needs. Can I pick faster? Can I make orders more, more precise? Uh, can I retain my labor? Uh, can I open up new things I can do with my warehouse because now I have automation? So I think those are all factors that are going to go into the ROI calculation. I do think, again, it's it's a it's not the majority. I think it's still a small percentage of, of, of companies that are thinking this way and are able to express it. I think the challenge for the industry is how do we come up with a more sophisticated ROI uh, for these, mm -hmm. these devices? Because a simple equation of, you know, bring in X saves you Y, therefore I do it. That's good. That's necessary. But that's not what I think is the long-term value prop of some of this automation. And I think, again, that's a challenge on all of us, right? So how do we better create that vision, that model, that ROI equation, if you will, uh, for people to invest in and to understand the long-term value uh, of, of these, these devices? Right. So oh, in, in other words, there are some soft benefits that are perhaps harder to measure, but should be in, in, in the factor. Yes, Ryan. What we I was, well, I was going to add one point <clears throat> or one word. I think um, resiliency is part of that play too. Like automation is part of not the, <clears throat> but part of, because I'm big on the hybrid workforce and, and automation together. But I think automation is a key part to building up a more resilient supply chain. Um, and I think all of, the, all of those things, when you look at your ROI, I think that pivots the way you look at that. If you look at how it can make you more resilient instead of direct return right away, more how am I preventing for issues in the future? Yeah, that's great. And, and Sid, do you have anything to add to that? Um, you know, there, there are just so many benefits, um, and to automation and it, it's always so important to decide how you want to look at the math. Like everything comes down to math and even for, yeah, even for resiliency, like there's a math equation for that. Are you measuring it? And so, um, you know, when, when I'm thinking, when I'm talking about the ROI with potential ROI with customers, it's, it's like, okay, let's get out a spreadsheet. Let's figure out where you find value and let's capture that value. And, and everybody has a different value function. And it's just an important conversation to have with each project, with each customer. Right. But I'm curious about what Guy was saying about sort of having to have a vision as well. Um, do you typically take potential customers to uh, to other you know, customers successful automated warehouses so that they can get a kind of wow moment or, or you know how, how do you encourage how do you foster that sense of vision when people are maybe just too focused on on the math Helen that's for me yeah, yeah. sure so, yeah. yeah um yeah the the customer visits are are the most important thing. And we try to encourage those as, as much as we can. Um, not only is it a great way to see what your peers in the industry are doing and, and find out some areas for improvement, but it's the best way to, to talk to other customers who've installed the type of automation that you're interested in and asking them about the, the reliability, asking them about um, what the deployment was like, what that process was like, what are the unexpected headaches, what are the unexpected rewards. You, if you're hiring a new employee, 
you should be making three reference calls. If you're investing in automation for the next 10 years, maybe visit three sites. Yeah, that's a, that's a great tip. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Sid, there's another question for you. Um, let's talk a little bit about artificial intelligence. Um, where will we see AI working in combination with automation in the future, or is it, or is it already here? I huge fan of of AI and automation, um, specifically machine vision for robotic piece picking. Mm. I I just think that's one of the coolest solutions that's newly available in warehouses. Um. You know, I, I think that for the most part, the technology is ready for for robotic piece picking. Um, I think the real challenge is making sure the integration feels seamless, that it doesn't feel like there's a cost to figuring out how to integrate the the AI into your warehouse. Um, you know, something that's important to keep in mind is even with all the amazing solutions that have been available for automation, uh, really since the 1960s, we've had the shuttle system, which is what, 60 years ago. And how many warehouses are completely manual right now? 80%. So hmm. if it's taken us this long to introduce what we think of as kind of normal warehouse automation, it's just going to take longer than people expect for there to be the robots that are applying machine vision that are deployed at scale um, because we need to get there first. We need to have the basic automation, um, the shuttle systems, the AMR solutions, you know, all the ASRS options. And then we're going to add on more AI after that. Right. But I, I'd be curious to know what each of you thinks about this. I, I think it, from where I'm sitting, it feels like there's been a tipping point relatively recently that, you know, I know it's taken a long time to embrace some very basic forms of automation, but it feels like there's a huge appetite for this now and, and that it's becoming, uh, you know, going from being a competitive advantage to a, to almost a must have, or, or is that too optimistic? Am I, uh, am I being a journalist who's, uh, you know, looking, looking forward rather than being in the now? What do you think, Guy? I think it's a little of the above, Helen. I think part of it, if we take, if we sort of decouple this, right? We look at the the heat, if you will, right, from a top of fold type discussion around AI, around robotics and automation. It's absolutely there, right? There, there's something there. But I'm going to date myself here. You know, when I was in college and I studied computer science, and it was last millennial, last millennium, right? It was not in this century. Uh, I was already studying AI, right? I was reading books about AI and studying AI. So this notion of AI has been around for a very long time. I think what we're seeing today is an explosion. This, this is true, an explosion of data. Um, you know, you, you you read statistics all the time that mankind has created more data in the past, you know, five years than we had in the past two million years, what have you. So the, the data is there. Uh, we have... The the computation power right now because of cloud computing and quantum computing and all this, right? we we have an ability to crunch a trimmers where we're getting all this excitement of what is the art of the possible? What do we do with this? Right to Sid's point, right? We're, we still need to be sober with this, with, re, with the reality of the adoption rate of other technologies is still far behind what we assume. One of the things I always remind myself, and I'm sure all of us on this call do, is you know, we live and breathe this, right? We we just take for granted things like robotics and AI and computing. You know, I, I go talk to folks in, in retail space and distribution and healthcare and all this, and guess what? They've got a day job and they're not, you know, worried so much with the regard to technology. They're looking for us to help them. So we have to realize there's still a chasm between where people are ready to adopt and ready to leverage with what we as pundits are talking and speaking and interested in. Now, I do think that there's going to be a continued push of adoption towards this because of the need for it. But I would, my caution is I think AI has been around for a long time. I think it's, it, there's great future with AI, but I would just sort of pump the brakes at times to say, you know, 
old fuddy duddies like me, we've been doing AI for a while. So it's not something that just came up in the past five years. Sure. No, I mean, spell check is, or, you know, autocorrect is AI. And we've had that for you know, a while. But um, just to be clear, what I was talking about was because I thought what Sid said was very interesting that you you sort of can't have uh, adopt, useful adoption of AI until you have a wider adoption of automation that and that there's been a slow adoption. But it feels to me like automation particularly is really having its moment. Um, particularly with all the sort of pressures in the market that that, that we discuss. Um, I, I, I just want to um, move along here. Um, um, Ryan, um, same question, but in relation to labor management, we just heard about AI in automation, but how about in labor management? Um, how is it going to be, uh, how is machine learning going to be used to optimize labor? Yeah, I think there's a, a a big opportunity for AI ML ingestion in labor management solutions and systems. Um, and we've already started with our solution at Longo. We've started in you leveraging it in our labor planning tool. So when you think about all the compute and all the trends and all the data you have, like like Guy said, this massive amount of data that we can reflect on and use to start thinking about well, what if I had done this or put staff this way um, and continuously learning so we can get smarter and start to start our day with the right staffing, the right people. A lot of times, uh, most warehouse managers tell you that their work comes in, they they know the volume, but when it starts hitting is when they get a feel and they start adjusting people, I think. So you can, on the front end, get better. That intraday piece, I think you, there's a lot of opportunity there as well. If you think about, you know, I have a pick mod, I can look at certain jobs. Maybe I can start to identify when congestion is physically starting to happen or learning and then reallocate work in the queue to relieve that without any interaction, right? Right now, a lot of managers, that's what they're doing is trying to watch an operation and make decisions. I think AI ML can do that. Um, there's there's a machine scale, right, to those computes. Or even if, you, if you're somebody who has targets or labor standards, one of the things that always comes up if I work in Atlanta, on a hot summer day, oh my gosh, this is a very different work environment, right? Than what maybe uh, a standard was based on. And I'm gonna get all industrial engineering on you because that's my background, but my personal fatigue and delay allowances is sort of a static number historically. What if I could look at the weather and dynamically adjust that for that day as those are happening? So uh, there's a there's a lot of, of opportunity, I think, to let technology start to, do that crunch and calculation, the things that's really hard for us to stay on top of. Right, that's really interesting. So um, AI and machine learning be useful, not just for sort of selecting uh, employees and vetting them, but also for managing them and deploying them in, in more efficient ways. Is that right? And correct, and going back to the comment, I mean, improving the user experience on the floor. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, I, I, I'd um, like to move into our Q&A session now. Uh, here are some questions from our lovely audience. Um, I'm just going to take a look at what we have. Um, oh, I have an interesting question here about language barriers. Um, that, that particularly in terms of training, I mean, obviously, uh, America being the melting pot that it is, we have people who speak many different languages. Um, how does uh, automation uh, uh, help with uh, reducing training time, particularly in, in the sense of making instructions more easily understood? Um, I'm, I'm trying to think, Sid, we, or Ogi, can talk to that. I, I, go ahead, Sid. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are a million different answers for this, but um, for for Exotech, we it is something we think about. Um, we've put a lot of thought into, and our interfaces. You, there are it's pretty basic, I guess. At the same time, um, simple is good, but but we have uh, we have different language options. It's a very visual interface, and so. Um, you know, pictures are worth a thousand words, but then we also just make sure that we have the flexibility in terms of different languages. So um, our our systems are very simple for the operators and language barriers really shouldn't be an issue. Yeah, Great. just to build on what Sid said, 
you know, Helen, real quick, you know, when I, at Six River, the same thing, uh, our AMRs, you know, you would come up, you would badge in, it would identify you and identify your, your language of choice. And then the screen would bring up that language. So to the question about training, ease of use, uh, a lot of visual cues, but also, you know, that, that customizable uh, from a communication language perspective, I think the robotics uh, and back to the AI and, and deep, you know, machine learning and all this, that's where there's tremendous opportunity to leverage you know, that that machine, so to speak, uh, to to help with training. Fantastic, thank you. We're getting some great questions here. Let me remind you, uh, we we very much want to invite your questions. Please submit your questions using the tab at the bottom of your screen, and we won't be using people's titles or company names. So feel free to ask anything you like. And if you don't see your question answered during the webinar, please be assured the Texas team will reach out to you offline. Um, I have a question here about uh, ROI and inflation. And I was wondering uh, if you could talk about how, I mean, obviously we're in a period of, of uh, highest inflation in decades. How does that uh, play into the decision, say, for example, putting in a, a cube density solution that could perhaps reduce major capital investments for the size of a new structure? E, that's probably one for you. I don't know. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good one. I I think it's a it's a valid discussion point now when it comes to looking at you know macroeconomic factors like inflation into the ROI calculator. I do believe it's one of those where if and when you're looking to make an automation investment is to work with whomever you're you're selecting and then you, if you have a consultant to calculate that in. And part of that calculation, I do think, also falls into is this a capital expenditure. Is this, uh, you know, a rental model, so to speak, a SaaS model, because that also could defer some of the costs and get around some of the inflation, you know, inflation issues we have today. I will say this, though, you know, one of the one of the macroeconomic aspects we have seen with regards to this is, you know, some automation uh, is capital intensive. So you're going to be paying more for commodities such as steel and rubber and glass and all this. Whereas others, if you're just getting a mobile robot, you're, right, you're going to be paying more on a rental service. So I think that inflation question is is unfortunately rearing its ugly head in the past few years because of the trickle down effect it also had on the price of commodities, uh, again such as steel and rubber and plastic and all this, uh, when it comes to putting your your robotic structure in there. So you know there's no easy answer. I think that's really uh, something that you would have to consider with the the vendor you're looking or with the model you're building. Uh, but also thinking about how it might impact other aspects of that robotics supply chain as well. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point, Guy. Thank you. Um, Sid, here, here's a question for you. Um, we, we mentioned earlier, you mentioned earlier that you, you want to, um, oh, I think it might have been Guy, uh, that it's a good idea if you're going to spend $10 million on an automation solution to visit three sites where it's already happening. Um, and the question from the audience is, how do you how do you find those three sites? Um, I, I like that question. So so at at Exotech, we we have a lot of sites globally that we're we're proud to show off to prospective customers. Um, next year, we're also rolling out um, something we're calling Exo Tours, the Exotech World <laughs> Tour, where every month we're going to be opening um, invitations for our customers to come meet with us at a different in a different city at a different customer site and and I think that'll um, that's expected to to be something that different customers at different part of their customer journeys will feel will feel happy to um, to join us for um, but yeah it is so important to see see different types of warehouses, even for the same solution provider. A lot of our warehouses look very different from each other and and you learn a lot with each visit. Right. I I, I want the t-shirt from the tour. I was, I was about to say I look forward to that tour t-shirt. <laughs> it'll it'll be epic, trust me. Fantastic. And I, I I seriously I would like to come on some of those site visits too. That would be great. Um I'd love to have you all. Thank you. Um, Ryan, here's a question for you. Um, what are some of the modalities of human to machine interaction that you are seeing right now? Specifically, do you see voice as a useful mode? Uh, sorry, I mean, sorry, that's partly labor, but it's partly automation. So Ryan, mm -hmm. start off and then we can hear from 
and say it. Yeah, I, um, I think you're seeing a combination of voice. So what I when I think of voice, I think of the old vocal act, not old, but I mean vocal act solutions, voice pick solutions that free up the hands, right? Um, I've been to more warehouses lately that have sort of a merge of voice and a scan or voice with automation. I think um, it's going to get it's it's always how do I improve that user experience? How do I free the hands up to do the work? Right. So I think voice is a play. I think voice with automation um, is a play when you start. There's that nuance then to make sure with language barriers. But uh, obviously, that's come a long, long way from when we first started doing voice technology. I think there's a I think those those will definitely come together for sure. Fantastic. Um Sid, what do you see? Is is voice still a useful mode? You know, I I'm gonna defer to Ryan on that because it, <laughs> okay. it's not it's not part of my wheelhouse as much. So I'm I I like his answer. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so uh, here's an interesting question. Um, automation automation streamlines processes and sometimes limits flexibility. What's your take on this? And what practices uh, ensure flexibility with automation. I can take a first pass of that. I, I think this begets a larger question around automation and where is sort of the line being drawn in terms of does automation keep keep labor also sometimes maybe even more into a, a sort of a lane and all you do is this. Um, I think that goes back to the question of all the different flavors of automation, right? I think we, we talked about this in the beginning about mm. you look at your warehouse, right? There are dozens, if not hundreds of use cases in your warehouse where automation can play a role. And within that, there's going to be different vendors and different types of automation. But I think the question is right. I think there's there's something to be considered when it's, you know, do I take a certain type of automation? And is that, well, it may on the surface solve a problem. Does it actually limit some of the flexibility I have, some of the ability to do other things with my labor within that warehouse? And, you know, I don't think there's there's a simple answer to that. I think that is a case by case situation, but it is absolutely something that anyone who's looking at automation has to take into consideration because it's an unintended consequence uh, that certainly could rear its ugly head. It's it's why I'm so big when I say hybrid, because I do think you need the consideration of both. Right. How can I you said it earlier, Guy, how am I planning for the future, right? Part of that future is how am I planning for my warehouse to be resilient? If something happens, how do I flex? So there is so much, I think, that needs to go into selecting the right solution. And that solution needs to to take into consideration all those elements we've been talking about. Um, how How do I make sure it's not a limiting factor in an area that's critically important to me? And if it is, how am I working around that? Because... I only get so much scale, right, uh, uh, in an ASRS that can do what it can do. It's fantastic and it gives me consolidation. But what happens when I have a scenario where I have to get more, right? Right. That that's very interesting. I, you know, obviously, it seems to me that in many situations, uh, automation increases flexibility. Uh, fantastic. Um, yeah. Uh, so it, it seems like a lot of robots and automation technologies do the same thing to the to the naked eye. They might all look very similar. What what are some of the key differentiators uh, in in the different technologies? Sid, maybe you could talk to that. That's that's a big question. Um, you know, for 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 us at Exotech, we are trying to offer a solution that that really maximizes three things, um, throughput, density, flexibility. And um, throughput in terms of we have very fast robots that move in 3D, they move at four meters per second. We can add more robots if we need more speed, more picking stations, if we need more throughput. Our, our racks go up 39 feet, so you can really fill up a warehouse. Um, and then flexibility just in terms of being able to add more robots, more racks as the demands change. Um, but at the same time, you know, different solutions have a lot of different strengths and different customers have different needs. 
So it's also super important to talk with a company like Texas who can help you assess all the different technologies that are available and, and find the, the right one for you. Yeah, All right, that's I great. Off, yeah, 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 sorry. Just quickly, I build off what Sid said is, you know, you need to look at what are your drivers. Flexibility, I think what Sid said, throughput, or those are all key aspects. I would also say one aspect to look at is, you know, greenfield versus brownfield, right? Are you putting in a system into a pre-existing warehouse where you already have uh, racking and space constraints? Or are you going in with a fresh slate, right? A, a brand new warehouse. And that's also going to help you understand, you know, what type of automation you want to go with. Um, and to your point, I think, you know, the challenge is that there's a, you know, a last count I saw there's close to 700 different automation OEMs out there offering a whole host of different types of robotics. So while on the surface, they might look kind of the same, a lot of them are doing a very precise or specific job within your warehouse. You know, Sid's solution is doing something that's very different than a fetch robot doing dunge dun removal. Uh, so that's the other challenge is to, you know, dive in deeper with the automation players to understand what is it that they're servicing? What are you trying to do? And back to Sid's point, you know, think about flexibility, think about throughput, uh, think about what your long-term plan is uh, and because those are going to be big drivers to that investment. Great. So um, I just wanted to touch briefly on um, another issue of complexity, which is um, that you, bundling uh, automation with warehouse management systems. I mean, everybody has a warehouse management system or should do. Um, what are the advantages of a better breed WMS uh, versus a bundled solution? Ryan, I think that's one for you. I think um, in any solution selection, flexibility and scalability are key, right? So what I keep going back, you keep hearing Guy and Sid say the same thing, right? You have to pick the right solution for you. So, so bundles can be great and platforms are great and that streamlines integration. But a six-person cross-stock facility is very different than a thousand-person e-com facility. Um, it, honestly, a lot of customers don't have single WMS platforms either, right? They, they've grown through acquisition. So I have... I may have a tier one over here. I have a homegrown over here. So I think whether it's automation, labor management, any type of solution, when I have multiple, I have to have a way to bring all of that together. And I think there's a lot of value um, in in leveraging a best of breed solution in that instance where, you know, that's you know, API driven and easy to integrate with and can communicate and bring a similar cohesive experience across these these host systems. I and mean, we're talking WMS, but I mean, think of ERPs and time and attendance and all of these that we want to start to feed into. Um, the more you branch that out, the more systems you touch. It, platforms are great. I'm not denying it. And if it fits for you, but I think there is a value for flexibility, scalability, and a best of breed solution for, for that kind of scenario. And this very much speaks to uh, the issue you know, of data and the enormous amount of data that there is to, to, to manage. Uh, wonderful. This is all great, but we're running out the clock. Uh, we have time for just one last question, and I'm going to pitch this to Guy from Texas. Um, Guy, if the warehouse of the future will be a combination of human labor and multiple types of automation, how do we ensure that not only does the human element work in tandem with automation, but that the different types of automation play nice with each other as well? Yes, yeah, play nice in the sandbox, right? As we tell our kindergartners to do. It, Alan, it's, that's the million billion dollar question. So I think there's going to be sort of three things people should think about. One, interoperability. And what does that mean? Is how do we get all these robotic systems to play nice in the sandbox, right? That is going to be key. Two is going to be around the labor division between automation and the humans. Humans are still going to do things much better than any robot can. And robots are going to do things that we as humans don't want to do anymore. And the third part, and I think we've touched upon it during this, and I think Rai talked about it, is really this change management, right? How does that impact your overall business? Not just in the warehouse, but your logistics, your fulfillment, your supply chain, everything outside of the warehouse. So for me, when we look at it, you know, to make sure that as we move forward, we all play nice in the sandbox, we take advantage of the robotics, that we work well in the warehouse, we got to focus on those three things, right? Interoperability, 
the division between human and robotic labor and the change management that's going to have to come regardless of what path you go down. Right. Thank you, Guy. That was a great answer. Um, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you so much to Guy from Texas, Sid from Exotech, and Ryan from Longbow Advantage. And then a special thanks to you, the audience, for participating. I think we've learned a lot about how to make sure humans and machines can work together for better outcomes. We had a lot of questions today, and we'll be answering the ones we didn't get to with you offline. You see on your screen right now a QR code and link to a landing page at Texas. You can capture the QR code on your phone. I'm sure you all know that. Um, those of you who registered uh, are also going to get an email later with this link, which will lead you to a Texas ebook, a Longbow blog, an Exotech blog, and a Texas blog. Plenty to chew on there, as well as a link to view the webinar on demand, which you can share with anyone. And there will also, of course, be contact information for Texas. Thank you so much to everyone for your participation. Stay safe, stay happy, and enjoy the rest of your day.